doing the work of ethics is not always easy. I've taught ethics many times here at the seminary, and in the past I've used different texts and different ways of approaching that. People often take ethics all excited because they figure they're going to get into some really great discussions about hard questions, you know, the sort of gray areas we call them in ethics, these areas where it's not clear exactly what you should do. There's not one precise direction, and they imagine students that we're going to be having lots of discussions about these gray areas. Well, in reality, ethics really boils down to guidance for learning how to live well. And from a Christian perspective, we would say learning how to live into God's purposes according to God's will. That's what ethics is about. So ethics, really rightly understood, is really kind of another name for sanctification or learning to become what God has told you you already are, learning to become what we're supposed to be in this world. Ethics is very much grounded in our lives in this world, in the coral mundo, before the world sort of realm. Now, in the old days, back when I was teaching this class, I used to use a textbook by a guy named Norman Geisler. And he's an evangelical, kind of fundamentalist-leaning Protestant who offered a very helpful textbook introducing you to basic ethical theories and different ways of thinking about it, especially from a Christian perspective. And he makes the, um, um, the argument that if you're a serious Christian seeking to obey God's commandments and do what God calls you to do, you really only have kind of a handful of options. One would be a situationism where you just have one ethic, just go and do the loving thing, and that's got big problems. I won't talk about that too much today. Basically, the problem there is you end up doing stuff that violates what God has clearly revealed in the name of the loving thing. But then he says the other options are what he calls either unqualified absolutism, conflicting absolutism, or graded absolutism. They're all absolutisms in that there is a will of God that needs to be done. Can, unqualified means you just do what you need to do no matter the situation and then let God sort it out. So if somebody's knocking on your door and saying, are you harboring Jews? And you are. You would say, yes, I am. They're underneath the floor here. And then it's God's business to sort it out because you have to obey God's law and you can't lie to anybody anytime, no matter what. Now, you can be clever and deft and, you know, find ways to work around it. But essentially, this position holds that, no, there is no real conflict for the Christian. You always simply do what needs to be done. The next one I'll take up is his graded absolutism. This is his own position. And he believes that within the world, there are these gray areas, living in a broken, fallen world, where things get messy. Things bump up against each other. But when they do, God has clearly given us a ranking, a hierarchy. Some people call this hierarchicalism, where you decide, this is the one thing I need to do, and then this is less. So lying to the people at the door who are looking for the, the Jews or the fugitives who are innocent would be the lesser evil than the evil of turning them over and being complicit in their, their death. So breaking the Eighth Commandment is a little less heinous than breaking the fifth commandment, and God knows this and won't hold you accountable for that lie. That's great at absolutism. Conflicting absolutism is the position of Lutherans. and Some people call this the lesser evil position. In this position, the idea is that you have to do something. You're in this gray area where you have to make a choice between what you do, and so you choose one of them, the lesser evil, and you're still responsible for that, and then God will forgive you for that, and you save yourself from a greater evil, and that's the way forward. And a lot of Christians look at this as absurd, because you're telling somebody to do something evil, and obviously God can't hold it evil when you're trying to do your best anyway. Now, my observation in all this is that I think there's a fundamental flaw with this whole process. And that fundamental flaw is that what's usually driving most of these kind of evangelical Protestant efforts to sort out ethical systems and how to know what to do in any given situation, what's driving it invariably is a strong desire to be in the right. These are individuals who don't want to ever be wrong. They don't want to have to be bothered with that really unpleasant business of having to repent for something. And that strikes me as kind of odd because after all, we know that sin is any violation of the will of God, which means not just a heavy-handed, I'm going to do the wrong thing even though I know it's wrong. It also means if I should have done something but I failed to, I'm responsible. It means I can sin in my thoughts against what God wants. It can even mean I might sin without even realizing it because I failed to do what God would have me do, and I'm accountable for that. When you think about sin as any violation of what God would have you do, and you're honest, you begin to realize that there's not a day that goes by that you don't have a pile of sins. That's just the reality. 
Lutherans are usually pretty good about driving that home, and so I think we maybe sort of have a different attitude towards the reality of sin. Not that we think it's no big deal, we go around looking to break rules, but we also know that sin is our lot. We are, after all, simul justus et peccator, at the same time sinner and saint, always together. It's the reality. So the way I look at this is very simple. Instead of being obsessed with my personal piety and my individual righteousness and my personal rectitude, making sure I never sin, I never do anything wrong, which usually is the motivation behind a lot of people asking, what about this situation? What about this situation? What they're worried about is, I don't want to be in the wrong. I don't want to do a wrong thing. I don't want to be guilty. That's not the motivation for a Christian. That's not what drives us. Luther was very clear on this. Luther said in his Freedom of the Christian, already in 1520, that a Christian lives outside of himself. He lives in faith toward God and in love toward his neighbor. And then he puts it this way, by faith he is caught up beyond himself into God, by love he descends beneath himself into his neighbor. And what's absent in this whole procedure of living in faith toward God, receiving his grace, and living in love toward my neighbor, serving what they need, what's absent is me. I'm not worried about me. I'm not worried about what I get, what I do, if I'm guilty. I just live for the sake of the other. This is the beauty of Lutheran ethics, and this, I would contend, is the significant, enormous contribution that Lutherans bring to any discussion about ethics. What we bring is a clear understanding that ethics is not about me making myself better or trying to preserve my integrity or my personal piety. No, ethics is all about living for the sake of the other. That's what I do. So when somebody's knocking at my door saying, are you harboring a fugitive? And I am, and they're innocent. What do I do? I serve the other. And I do the thing I need to do. I take care of those who are hiding, and I find some way to protect them, whether I lie flat out or find some subterfuge, like Rahab finds some way around it, or they just lie flat out. Either way, you say, I'm going to do what God calls me to do and serve my neighbor the best I can in union with his revealed will. I don't just run roughshod over his will and start doing willy-nilly violations of what God has clearly revealed. His law is there to be followed. It is his will for our lives. But in this broken world, the things bump up into each other. We get into these gray area situations where we have to make choices between two things that are both looking lousy. And so what do you do? You pray, you seek counsel, you get some good wisdom, and you make a choice and for that choice, yes, you are responsible, accountable before God. And if you are sinning by doing that, ask God for grace, and he'll give it every time. You don't have to sweat it like, oh no, I'm falling outside of God's grace. No, you're living in his grace. You receive his grace. This is the beauty and the power of the Lutheran understanding of ethics. It's not about you becoming a better. It's not about you doing the right thing or you being the right person. What it's about is you being a follower of Christ, serving those around me, doing what God calls you to do. That's the focus. It's always outside of self, never worried about yourself. This is captured beautifully in one of the often misquoted sections from Luther where he is giving counsel to his protege or his younger colleague, Melanchthon. This is in 1521 he wrote a letter to Philip about some other things and he ends with this. If you are a preacher of grace, then preach a true and not a fictitious grace. If grace is true, you must bear a true and not a fictitious sin. Now, let's just pause there a minute. What that means then is, if you're going to give real grace, there needs to be real sin. We don't have these kind of, oh, I'm not really needing grace today because I'm not a sinner. What? Yes, you're a sinner. You are in desperate need of his forgiveness. And if you don't feel a need for his forgiveness, you don't need grace. So if you're going to preach real grace, real gospel, there needs to be real sin, real law first. We need to be convicted of our need for his forgiveness. And then the gospel comes. So be a preacher of true forgiveness. And that means you have to be a true sinner, a real sin, not a fictitious one. God, this is back to Luther, God does not save people who are only fictitious sinners. Be a sinner and sin boldly, but believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly, for he is victorious over sin, death, and the world. That's beautiful. See, when Luther says, sin boldly, he's not saying, do what you want, who cares? He's not saying, be courageous and go do something. He's not saying, run roughshod over the will of God or the purposes of God or the commandments of God. What he's saying is, be honest about who you are, a sinner, 
in desperate need of God's grace, a sinner who sins in every good deed, because no matter what you do, you are falling short of God's purposes. Even our righteous acts need God's forgiveness. As Isaiah says, all of our righteous acts are as filthy rags. We need grace up and down all the time, always. And the only reason we do good works is because Christ dies for those good works as well and redeems them. So to be a sinner and to sin boldly means be courageous in who you are in Christ. Step out and serve the neighbor and then receive God's forgiveness, which is right there waiting for you. Believe all the more boldly, as Luther says. That's the key to living the Christian life. And this is the, this is the beautiful, phenomenal contribution that Lutherans bring to ethics. Not about me and me trying to be right and avoid having to repent. I wouldn't want to have to repent. No, it's about me being honest about who I am. God's forgiven child desperately needing His grace and having it, and then God's creature who goes out and serves those around me in my vocations and gives of myself for them. And when I end up in sinful situations, I seek His forgiveness. I don't seek out those sinful situations. I don't violate God's will willy-nilly, but I also bravely and confidently serve my neighbor, and I do what needs to be done. And the church and the teaching I learn and my ethical training teach me what those right things are. I learn. It's not like there's a gradation that's all clearly laid out. It's a matter of doing the right thing in any given situation according to God's will revealed and according to good counsel. And I take responsibility. Ask for forgiveness when I need to and delight in the grace and delight in the reality that I get to be God's servant to those around me. That's a uniquely Christian ethic. That's a uniquely Lutheran contribution. Not about you. It's about serving those around you. That's what it's all about.